I was very quiet about my grief when I started to feel it, and most people weren't even aware that I was experiencing what I was because I didn't talk a lot about it. And they would say, well, you have never complained. And I thought, yeah, right, maybe not to you, but in here. My name is Liz Tully. I turned 81 earlier this year and I live in Toronto, Canada. I now have advanced AMD or age-related macular degeneration in both my eyes. In my left eye I have geographic atrophy which is the dry form and in my right eye I have both wet AMD and the dry form geographic atrophy. I have learned yep. how to ask for help, and I've always had very good responses. It is hard initially because you're losing a sense of yourself as well. I mean, it's all wrapped up in yep. there. I just say, I'm sorry, but I have a bit of vision loss. People understand, and it's really helpful that they do have that understanding. I've always been a pretty organized person, but for me, I now I have to be even more organized. And that means being prepared ahead of time, not just <laughs> being ready at the last minute when I'm ready to go out the door. And when I go to the market, that's particularly important because I only shop there once a week. So I have to make sure I've got my list, I've got my money, I've got my bundle buggy, double check to make sure I've got on my sunglasses because that's really important now. The sun makes my eyes very uncomfortable. And I have my keys. Boy, I hate to forget those. I was born in the, on the island of Aruba in what's called the Netherlands Antilles now. And that was in the days when people didn't know about what the sun can do to people with blue eyes and fair skin. It was a wonderful place to grow up though because the sun always shone and we were outside all the time. I am a walker, I've always been a walker, I love to walk. And it can be through the city to explore new neighborhoods or it can be traveling and exploring whole countries and whole cultures. That was so much a part of me. And yet it can't be now, that's okay. I've had my time being abroad it's during the period I was in, first in Toronto, in my early 40s, that my mother's cousin happened to mention that she had macular degeneration. My mother did too, and another cousin of theirs as well. So I might get it. I think that played a huge role in the fact that I still have the level of sight, the quality of sight that I do, given the fact that I've had AMD now for quite likely 20 years. I'm really glad that I started taking whatever measures I might, I was aware of, like diet and exercise and that kind of stuff. I was interested in anything that would delay any progress. So when I was first diagnosed, there were no treatments for AMD, and so I would just be told that if when and only when I asked, if, oh, I had a few tired spots. I guess it was in my early 60s, and I noticed when I was reading at night, and the light wasn't particularly great in my den, that um, I, I'd have to keep sort of blinking hard to carry on, because I couldn't see the pages very well. I guess a few years after that, I would stumble over words in a way I, had, I never did before, and where lines would merge, or there might even be a whole line appearing above where it should be, and I'd have to blink hard and get it back. So I thought, hmm, I wonder maybe if this was a macular degeneration that I had, and maybe I was getting some symptoms of it. I had gone to see um, an ophthalmologist during that period, and that is when he would talk about my tired spots, which when I then had chance to do a bit of reading, and I asked if they were drusen, he admitted that yes, they were. I know now that he was so casual about the diagnosis, if you can't treat 
or prevent a condition or heavens, you know, curing it was just out of the question, then you didn't talk about it. I've come to realize that it's so important that you have a comfortable working relationship with your doctor, that you respect each other and you, um, you trust each other, and also that you're communicating clearly to each other because so much is dependent on that communication. I needed to feel comfortable asking my questions. And I sensed that when I would ask the questions, there would be a bit of um, deflection or generalities, like being told my vision was stable when I knew it wasn't. Because I live in a large city near a major intersection, I always used to use the counter at the intersection to tell me whether or not I had enough time to get both to the end of the sidewalk I was walking on, to then cross the street in safety, and then go up on the other side. And as time went by, I began to realize I couldn't really read that timer well enough until I was, mm, you know, half a step, a step a bit closer. And then suddenly I realized, actually, I can't even see what it's saying clearly enough to trust it until I'm practically on top of it. And so I gave him that example and he said, oh, well, my scan didn't pick it up. It feels like it's my experience, my lived experience, my life, it's kind of being dismissed. Well, actually, you don't know how well you can see because I, I can tell you how well you can see, but you can't. You're telling me how well my eye is working, but only I know how well I can see. Now that my vision is getting more and more compromised, I'm much more focused on my functional vision, how well I can actually see. That was one of the stresses I could address if I could find a doctor who understood that better and could give me answers that I could relate to. And I found that with the second doctor I'm with now, and I learned what I needed to know at the level I needed to know it, which was not a lot of detail, but just how are things looking in my first appointment. And I could just feel the stress just flowing out of me. One of the things that's a frustration to me now is that in the normal course of events, for most people like me who have macular degeneration and your vision starts to go, say, in one eye more than the other, and all of a sudden you're doing things like walking along a sidewalk and the next thing you know, you're flat on your face. How did that happen? That's when, through my research, I discovered that there were things like depth perception and contrast sensitivity and the impact that losses in either, never mind both, of those conditions can affect how well you see. It's a beautiful day today. Oh my gosh. It sure is. Mm -hmm. wow. So these kinds of things, we just, you know, we just don't realize the impact they can have because it can be so subtle. Dappled light can be a big problem or coming across a step in a, a darker area in the late evening when you're walking on a sidewalk and you don't realize there is a step or you don't realize how high it is. And so you go to take what you think is an okay step and again, you're flat on your face. Now I know that there are specialists in the healthcare field that deal with that very issue. When we're nervous about balance, we tend to go more fetal and more bent over. It's true. And yeah. we need these muscles on the side of your hip for walking and for balance. Try each leg one more time. Okay. So being tall on that leg, nice. Do you think that's going to be doable for you in your home exercise program, like once a day? Yeah, I okay. think so. I Great. think so. So Liz, we're going to work a little bit on your alignment in motion. Um, mm -hmm. Specifically, I want to look at how you carry your head. So it doesn't have to be super rigid, but that you lengthen the back of your head 
like so. Mm -hmm. And that's going to help you access all of those proprioceptors in the back so that your spine can see. Let's come out here a little bit further. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> right now you are facing your window, mm -hmm. the blinds. You can see a little bit of light mm -hmm. coming through there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you did a quarter turn to your right to face the couch, now you're going to notice that the light from the window is hitting you in a different way. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, and then you turn quarter turn away from the window. And one eye is getting it, but the other eye isn't. Right. And then you just notice the space has changed a little bit with the lighting. Mm -hmm. and another quarter turn to your right. Mm -hmm. And now ah, so yeah. the, light, the light is hitting your, the right side yeah. of your body. Yes, that's right, in my right eye. And then you do one more quarter turn to go back to the window. Good. So we're and gonna both, do eyes, my, both of my eyes are aware of the light now. Yeah. So now I want to see if you can do that with your eyelids closed. When I began to realize that, you know, yes, you now have AMD, and yes, it is progressing, I decided that one of the things I wanted to do was make a change in where I lived. Because it's really important for me to be as independent as I can be, as long as I can be. And where I was living, there could be issues with that. It was a lovely area. It was. It, oh, it's a beautiful area to walk in, but I also knew I would have to find a way to get out of that area uh, for everything else I did. I wanted to be closer to all the things I might need as my AMD progressed so that I could do that easily, safely, comfortably. And in fact, I'm well situated because my ophthalmologist, my retinal specialist, is, gosh, I could walk there. I found out I could even still walk down to the train station when I want to visit people who live out of town. And I could walk to, and I do, to grocery stores, my drugstore, all of it. It's actually safer for me to be downtown than to be in the suburbs because we have sidewalks here and we don't have as many multi-lane roads that we have to consider and maneuver around. And to be honest, at heart, I'm also a city girl. Yeah, the sun is lovely, but it's really bright in my eyes. You good? Yep. Okay, I'll go first. Okay. Those melons are yeah. delicious yeah. still. Right. Let me see how heavy. It's heavy. Wow. I can't see very well, so you pick what works for you in there. Okay. <clears throat> I live alone, so where am I going to live? Whoops, I have to watch that. Will I still be okay here? Or will I need to look for another place to live? Hey, Hannah. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Did you have a good week? Yeah, how about you? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, kind of boring, but in a good way. Just having AMD in and of itself is very stressful. So that was one of the things that led me to look around my place and, well, where the stress is not so much there now, but it's coming. What can I do? Well, the first thing I could do is get rid of clutter. And that is a hard thing to do when you are my age and you've got a lot of things in your life. But it makes a huge difference. So now I've got all these little piles neatly laid out, which I'm sure when somebody comes in, what on earth is she doing there? That's okay, you know, it works for me. It's very important that I don't leave pots or jars or bottles open or glasses where if they are knocked over, I've now got liquid all over the floor that somebody has to clean up, but I live alone. So who is that somebody? And if it happens to be glass that has shattered, I can't see all those little shards. So I've started a little collection of food grade old plastic containers and they all have tops so at least something is not going to spill out if it's got a top. I haven't had breakfast, this is nice. As I'm losing my sight and I'm losing 
my energy level and my productivity level, I've got to get more serious about these things. So everything is very organized and I also, try, <laughs> I also try to get vitamins from different brands because they have different shape bottles and they can have different coloring. I can now tell by feel and I practice doing this, closing my eyes, seeing if I can find them all, and I can. And that's why it's so important also that there is a place for everything and everything in its place. It is a different way of operating, but it's not terrible, and I'm learning to live with it all. If you live, especially if you live alone, and you want to maintain a pretty active life, and you've got all these other constraints, energy level, productivity level because of lighting and what you can see when, and all these other factors and some other conditions that you might have might also impact that. There is that phrase, lean into the fear, don't run from it. And that's what I've been trying to do. Once you have gotten past it and you've become more used to it and more accepting of it, and have found a way to deal with it in a way that you feel safe and relatively competent because my standards aren't what they used to be. I used to like things to always to look quite nice and to be neat and to be clean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you can't do that if you've got vision loss. So I love that phrase. It's good enough. <laughs> hey, they're having a good time. Eh? They are, aren't they? Yeah. Once I found a way to pivot and get away from Thank you. the downside, the losses, and started looking at the positive side, I was able to accept, well, this is my life as it is, and it's not going to change, so I want to make the best of it. And it is important, I believe, to grieve that loss because it is a loss. It's a huge loss. You used to be able to do everything you wanted to do with such ease, and now you were facing a future where you knew that wouldn't be possible, but how bad was it going to be? So need time to try to come to grips with all of that. But then the thing of it is, once you've done that, you've still got a life to live. And so you've got to find a way to get beyond it. I really believe that very firmly. And that's where attitude comes in. You know, how you look at something, from what perspective, makes such a huge difference. If you're looking at the negative side, the loss, then it's, you know, it feels like nothing but doom and gloom. And you can't get beyond it. And Often, initially, you know, you kind of want to retreat from the life you've had because you're so afraid that you won't be able to not perform, but you won't be able to live naturally the way you did. And so it's a spiral. It's just a downward spiral. Or at the very best, you know, it's, it's sad to me. It's very sad because there's still so much possibility out there. And if you can change that focus and start to look at, well, what have I still got left? Actually, we've got a lot left. And being able to accept that, to really take it in, I think is what they call resilience, you know, just being able to pick yourself up again. When I was a kid, I remember there was a toy. I think it was called a roly-poly doll or something like that. It was a painted face and it was sort of sit on top of a ball and no matter how hard you knock that ball down, pop, up it would come again. That is how I try to approach the, the ongoing deterioration of my vision. Okay, well we've lost that one. Now what can we do to, if not deal with it directly, work a way around it? Acceptance is not resignation. Resignation is just, well, I guess it can't get any better, so I might as well just live with what I've got. I've never heard of Cosmic Chris. What magical country do they come from? Whereas acceptance is, 
well, I've just got to live with whatever That's I've good. got. But what can I do about it to make it better? And to me, that is the real key. Because if you can make that leap on the positive side, oh, cool. you can live your life as fully as you are able to <laughs> with the adjustments that you can make. And also, it encourages you to stay out and about in the world. And to me, that is a win-win for everybody. I wish my bestie could be like that with me when we grow old, because I was looking at you, you're picking <laughs> yeah. fruits. You always make connections you're not expecting to. Yeah. And that's the thing of it, and I, that's what I tell people with my vision loss, be out in the world. Yes. Because that way you get to see people, they get yeah. to see, and you see we're normal, well, sort of normal, right? Yeah. <laughs>